Well, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome you to the first meeting of our 189th session of the Society. And tonight uh, we have what's effectively an in-house talk uh, by Brian Nowenya. Uh, he's the professor of microbial geochemistry here. And he's also head of the School of Science, so you don't get much higher than that in terms of presence. Um, he was geologically educated at Reading University, took his uh, BSc and a PhD in uh, uh, organic geochemistry. Was it just geochemistry? Yeah. yeah. And um, he then tried out industry for a while. Uh, to see if that was the route he wanted to go and decided that he, he preferred university? More or less. More or less. And so he came to Edinburgh. And that I was postdoc. And eventually, apparently, he became a proper academic. And I understand from the notes I've been provided with uh, that he founded um the uh geochemistry laboratories microbial geochemistry laboratory which is successfully uh, working today and getting money for students and so on and um his current research has changed a bit over those times from his phd being on uh lanthanum metallics and uh, what was it, what else was that involved in? Uh, so, so phosphorus. Phosphorus. Yeah. yeah. So he's now <laughs> gone from the inorganic very much to the semi-organic. Semi well, microbes yeah. considered organic. Yeah, you can. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so tonight he's going to give us a lecture uh, entitled "Our Planet: Health and Well-being, Microbiological Approaches to Protecting the Environment." And feeding the world. So, no doubt from that we'll know what he's been doing for the rest of his career. <laughs> okay, Brian. All right. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, <laughs> for, for that introduction. I also know Mike actually from playing football, uh, you know, around the uh, grounds of Edinburgh. Uh, and, and also, uh, we've done some work together, I think, when. Um, the Granton place was being developed. We did some consultancy work for Edinburgh City Council together. So uh, thanks very much for, for that introduction. Um, as, uh, as Mike says, I'm, I'm uh, going to share with you some of the work that's been going on in, in at my lab, uh, uh, particularly focusing on the role of microbes. Um, and, and the focus here is on uh, environmental cleanup. Uh, but uh, really, that there is a geological component of it. So, you know, the interest uh, for uh, you guys is uh, to really try and link to the fact that, you know, what, what we're doing is a result of some of the, uh, you know, work that we do uh, in terms of finding minerals and producing those minerals and then um, the impact that that has. And before I start uh, sharing that talk with you, just uh, some acknowledgements, just in case I forget at the end of the day. Um, so uh, a lot of people in, in yellow that have uh, actually been contributors to this work, people that have worked in my lab, and then uh, external collaborators, uh, some of them in the UK in the first line, and then others abroad uh, in the second line of white. So just to make sure that, you know, this is always teamwork, it's never uh, one person's um, endeavor. Um, as I say, why would we as geologists be uh, interested in this? Good point. I did, did say I was going to try and uh, does that work? Uh, but it means now people can't see me. So, which is, uh, you know, it's that there's several different lighting schemes. Is that better? So if I stand up, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So why do we, as George, are we interested in this? Well, again, Mike was talking about the picture of Cornwall where he was, you know, doing some holidaying and then seeing students actually doing some mapping. But also Cornwall is famous for obviously uh, tin mining. 
uh, as a result of that, a lot of actual problems associated with you know, uh, the leftovers. And some of them is in soil, some of in the catchment area, some of them is, is actually in the water and the rivers. So that map on the left there was actually from a UK government report that I just picked up uh, off the web just to acknowledge that. Uh, but clearly that contamination has uh, major implications in terms of uh, the ecosystem. Uh, so if we look to the right uh, rivers there, um, it doesn't just affect the quality of the water, it's also affect the ecosystem, the life that actually lives uh, in those environments. <clears throat> and again, as you can see, in most cases, you know, most of what we're dealing with here is metal contamination and uh, there are obviously other types of contamination. So my interest is very much in, in metal contamination. And in actual fact, I'm giving you some hint of what I'm focusing on here. So most of what I'm gonna be talking about today is zinc contamination. Uh, I like working with zinc uh, for two reasons. One is that it has very simple chemistry. So if I'm looking at, you know, pollution and toxicity, uh, or I'm concerned about is, is very simple chemistry. I don't have to worry about redox. The other thing, reason is that actually zinc uh, is a schizophrenic uh, metal uh, from the point of view of toxicity, okay? So you can see quite clearly here, on the one hand, it's toxic, you know, and that can be to aquatic life, it can be to cows, calves in this particular area. Uh, but for me, as a Malawian, there's also actually selfish reasons, okay? I grew up in Malawi where unlike you guys that have a choice to whether to be vegetarian or to eat meat, I didn't have a choice. Most of my diet was actually vegetarian and particularly dependent on cereal. Okay, so zinc of interest to me because uh, about 48% of the Malawi population is actually deficient in zinc and it has major implications in terms of health. Um, I'm five foot six and a half, so remember that half, yeah, always have to remember that bit. Uh, but I've got my sons who are being brought up here uh, on what I could consider a proper diet who were six foot plus. Okay, so I have a funny feeling that my height is probably because I lacked zinc when I was growing up. So major interest for me. Um, and the thing about Malawi is that it's not that there isn't zinc in the environment. So in the soils, for example, there's a lot of zinc. But you know, in a lot of the global south, actually, there is a problem of zinc bioavailability. It's not available to plants because our diet is plant-based. Um, and uh, even when it's available, so you know, when you try to um, basically augment it with fertilizer, uh, you still have problems in terms of absorbing that zinc from the diet. So these are sort of major things that I'm hoping some of the work can contribute to, but we're not there yet. <clears throat> Okay, so what the work that I do actually can be classified into uh, two uh, areas. One is actually understanding, uh, so zinc is a very mobile uh, element in the environment. And one of the things we're trying to do is how can we help actually clean up zinc by actually immobilizing it within the environment itself. So we work with microbes there uh, where we can grow biofilms and then we look at how those biofilms then can attenuate the movement uh, of zinc. Uh, so we can look at zinc from a dissolved phase, but we can also look at it from a point of view of metallic phase, particulate phase, and uh, the subject of zinc oxide nanoparticles and zinc uh, sulfide nanoparticles uh, is quite important. The other then is actually knowing that it's actually there in the environment, you actually want to remove it. Okay, so that's the second bit. This is just attenuation within the environment here, I'm trying to remove it. And so some of the work that we're doing involve actually co-precipitation, uh, but again, using uh, the ingenuity of microbes to achieve those processes. And, and so I'll give you an example, and this is what I want to focus on, an example where we can use this co-precipitation uh, driven by microbes as a way of cleaning up uh, water, in this particular case, focusing on the mine water pollution. And then uh, for the second example, I just wanna give you some of the work that we're doing right now in the lab where we're looking at uh, how having microbes in a natural environment. So if you look at a natural soil and you compare with the number of bacterial cells within the root environment, within the root environment, we've got 10 to, you know, sorry, two to three orders of magnitude more microbial cells. And so do they have an impact in terms of actually helping us with plant health? And I'll give you the context for uh, each one of those. 
So uh, that's probably just what I've just talked about. Uh, two examples that I'm going to look at, water uh, cleanup, uh, mine water cleanup, and then the other one using a bacteria. But in each case, you know, what we're trying to do is answer a couple of fundamental questions. Um, one of the things that as you get uh, mineral uh, precipitation, and I'll show you a bit more examples here, is that the microbes themselves can be entombed in the minerals that are precipitating. So why would an organism actually carry out a process that then buries it? You know, how do they cope with that? You know, is there a role for it? And uh, the other uh, question that arises is that, is that, you know, is that a mechanism for actually fossilization? So if we start looking at other planets, we look at ancient Earth, and we look at the evolution of life, can we find evidence in some of the biological minerals? <laughs> um, the second example is where I want to look at the use of plant uh, bacteria to, put, uh, to protect plants, so toxicity uh, of uh, metals to uh, plants. Um, here, I'm interested in what are the mechanisms? Uh, how do bacteria actually do this? So I'll show you evidence of that uh, protection. And then uh, for me, as I said earlier on, it's really the nutritional implications that actually come out of this, uh, which, which is something that we haven't developed yet, but I'm looking to develop. So if you like the nutritional implications are a hypothesis that I want to pose uh, at the end of this talk. Okay, so just a, a recap then, I'm, I'm talking about co-precipitation, biomineralization, uh, quite simply defined, you know, are we as bi biological organisms actually make minerals and uh, so, you know, you uh, get your calcium and your phosphate from your food and you make your bones. Uh, other organisms, organisms do, uh, actually sort of make different types of minerals, so calcium carbonate here. This is actually quite a common characteristic of, of all living things, okay? And the bacteria are no exception to that. Uh, one of the key things about uh, the, the fact that we can see organisms making minerals is that quite often they have very unusual uh, mineralogy and sometimes very specific crystallographic properties. And so from the point of view of actually uh, paleontology, if you're looking again at uh, areas where you're looking at the origin of life and the role of microbes on other planets, which we think might be the only form of life that exists, then looking for, you know, these microbial minerals is actually quite an important uh, route to doing that. So biomineralization is really the process by which organisms make minerals. And what I'm interested in here is what sort of biomineralization bacteria actually do and how can we harness that uh, to actually clean up uh, our environment. Uh, just uh, a little bit more details in this. Uh, when you look at biominerals in the environment, they're gonna come in two types. One is where the organisms has key biological control on the process itself and quite often on the shape and type of minerals that uh, precipitate. So some of you will be uh, have heard of magnetotactic bacteria. Okay, and these are bacteria that actually make magnets uh, within their cells and they use it for navigation. Okay, uh, quite, quite important. And they have to be to very carefully control how they make that. So you call that biologically controlled mineralization. Uh, it can be done within vesicles in cells or they can produce templates, you know, outside and then they actually excrete the contents to actually determine the shape of that mineral. The alternative, which is what I'm gonna be uh, we, we, we relying on, which is more common, is what we call biologically induced biomineralization. And this is one where the organism is metabolizing, it's carrying out its everyday duties, uh, but it doesn't control the morphology and quite often the composition of you know, the mineral that forms. Okay, so this is much more common in the environment. And in fact, within the Earth's surface in the top, you know, one meter or so, actually these kind of biominerals are actually quite common. The, the organism is metabolizing, it's a waste product that then change the external environment where that uh, mineral uh, formation uh, occurs. And the problem is this is that quite often these uh, minerals actually precipitate on the cell surfaces themselves. So that's a problem that organisms have to deal with. You know, why would they be doing this? Maybe there is some advantage and there's been some speculation uh, that actually uh, some of them actually do this deliberately, okay? Even though they can't control the chemistry, but they do this deliberately because it's a way of protecting themselves. So they entomb themselves, they can protect themselves from ultraviolet radiation. And so there's a reason uh, why they do it. 
But you can see quite clearly that if you've got lots of minerals precipitating us, so this basically the starting point of a clean cell here, uh, when you're encrusted with minerals, you also have issues on, you know, how do you get your nutrients that you need to survive, okay? Um, it obviously must be an advantage, but also, you know, what's the mechanism by which you start uh, protecting yourself to make sure you still survive uh, after that process. So I'm just going to give you one example where we've actually observed this in a natural setting. So we're not actually, you know, artificially driving this. This is like actually a natural setting of biomineralization driven by bacteria that actually uh, is very effective at cleaning up, uh, you know, the contamination that we've caused. We are in Sardinia here in Italy, and that's the Southwest and Sardinia actually, whole island is well known for some uh, lead zinc uh, biomineralization and a lot of mining activity. So the mine we're looking at here uh, is actually in the Southwest and was actually closed in about 1968. So lots of, you know, uh, these mines have now been exhausted. And it's actually at the top uh, of a very small stream here, the Rio in, uh, in the Narakauri, that actually flows into the Mediterranean. And for most time of the year, particularly autumn and winter, this water is completely contaminated with zinc. And so you can see where it's coming out here. This is blown up here. And this is the pipe that's actually coming out of it. This is all the mine waste dump that's been left over here. And you've got a pipe here that's coming out and draining that water. And then that water basically uh, collects and forms a river that flows into the Mediterranean. So for the whole of that stream for uh, autumn and winter, it's contamin contaminated with zinc, up to 400 parts per million. Now, that's okay for some organisms. It's actually completely toxic. To all of them. It's also got a lot of lead in it and also a lot of cadmium, okay? So really contaminated water flowing into the Mediterranean. Of course, the Mediterranean is quite big, so it gets diluted there, but uh, for those, you know, uh, six to seven months or so, the water is actually really bad. Um, come spring, however, as soon as we start getting some sunlight and in summer, uh, the water halfway through that stream is completely clean, okay? It's got no zinc, it's got no cadmium, it's got no lead, all right? What happens is actually a very simple process. Uh, within the stream, uh, when you start getting sunlight, you've got a cyanobacterium. So this is a bacteria, so, you know, sometimes we call them blue-green algae, but it's actually a bacterium. So it's a photosynthetic bacteria that actually grows as a biofilm on any surface in, of the water in, uh, in, this, in the stream. And once it does so, because of photosynthetic activity and that photosynthesis, that's metabolism that it's using to manufacture its food, drives the pH at the surface of the cell. This is what we think. So this is, uh, uh, you know, Porter's work. Uh, drives the pH quite high at the surface of the cell. And that's results in the precipitation of a mineral called hydrozincite here, which is a zinc uh, carbonate. Now, what you can see here is incrustations of those minerals in this reed bed, uh, but in actual fact, it uh, takes place within sort of a very short distance. Uh, and then from here onwards, for most of the time, the water is actually completely clean, okay? That hydrozincite, even though it's just a zinc carbonate, also takes up with this all the lead and all the cadmium. So we have a very, very good mechanism for actually cleaning up uh, our, our water here. Um, and that's, again, that's an induced process because it's a result of, you know, metabolic activities. Uh, the organisms here, you know, are not controlling uh, the shape uh, of the minerals that form uh, or indeed the composition, okay? We've been looking at a little bit more of this with the, uh, obviously the concept that, you know, we, we need to understand exactly, you know, what is driving the formation of these minerals? What impact do they have on the survival of the cells that are actually precipitating them? So this, this incrustation I was talking about. Um, and then, you know, what, what are the long-term impacts in terms of, you know, can we, if we go there, so, you know, a million years from now, can we find these microbial cells as, as evidence that there's been life there? Those are some of the questions that we've been trying to pose. 
So when you look at maybe a little bit more at the textures that you see here, this is sort of now a detective story uh, as geologists, you look at the way these actually minerals precipitate. So they start as globules quite often on uh, what we uh, it is it actually a series of organic material. So most of this is outside the cells, organic material where the precipitation occurs. And then as they grow, uh, they actually start uh, bunching up. Uh, I call this a raspberry morphology, they start bunching up. Uh, but you can also see they're actually extremely porous. Okay. And the key thing here is that although they're spherical, they're you know, uh, round and stuff like that, they're also extremely porous. Um, and we think there's a clue there to you know, why that might be uh, the case. Um, it's not just an isolated example. So wherever you see life, where you see, particularly where you see bacteria, uh, forming minerals, this actually morphology and texture is actually replicated. Okay, so this is another example. This is in France, where you've got a mine uh, that basically uh, mine water is contaminated with arsenic. And again, the bacteria induce the precipitation of this mineral, which is an iron uh, arsenic, uh, basically, uh, you know, forms very similar textures. This is uh, in a lake uh, in, in Canada. So this is dipingite, uh, magnesium carbonate mineral, that again precipitates with very similar morphologies. Uh, but you can see when you actually home in, in those morphologies, you've got these plates, things that sort of like precipitate as plates, but then they basically come together and, and coalesce as, as these spherical aggregates, as I call them. We think there's actually um, a vital effect to this. There's a reason why we get these structures. And the, so the hypothesis we've been working on is actually do bacteria have a mechanism for controlling this, uh, uh, this uh, structure that we see, this morphology that we see? Because when you actually look at them as individuals, when you home in, what you find is they're plates, okay? They're needles, okay? But those needles then seem to coalesce into these balls. Uh, and so our hypothesis is here is actually, they need to do this in order to uh, improve their survival, because if you've got balls precipitating on your surface, you can actually uh, have holes where you can use to respire, but also uh, exchange nutrients. The question is, how do they actually move from here uh, to something like that? So that's really sort of just a simple hypothesis that we wanted uh, to test. Uh, but we think that is key to survival, although it also might have an impact in terms of uh, uh, the preservation of those cells. Okay, oh, um, I think I need to go back one. Can I do that from here? Yeah, okay. So how might these uh, uh, bacterial cells actually do that? Well, Actually, one way of what we see in the literature when we do these experiments is we see that actually, as soon as you introduce some chemistry into biology, particularly if you've got toxic uh, chemicals, then the bacterial cells start producing these globules. They're almost like oily globules. And then within those globules, that seems to be the focus for where those, these minerals actually precipitate. Okay, so here, they're actually more or less directing the shape by producing globules, which then determine the shape of the molecule. <clears throat> in most cases, however, you don't uh, see this uh, structure. What you see is things like this, very similar to what I've been showing you about what's happening in Sardinia. Uh, but uh, the key component here is that wherever we see this structure, we see, see an association with this organic. So when you're talking about combined organic and uh, inorganic, uh, it's actually quite apt to, to the uh, observations that we see. So I think the idea here that we have is that, or at least we're hypothesizing, is that it's the organics that are produced by the bacteria or as part of the bacterial makeup that are controlling this morphology. Um, and that's not a hypothesis that's with, not without precedent because experiments have been done in the lab. So this is just looking at calcium carbonate precipitation in the lab and looking at how the presence of organic molecules that might be produced uh, by these bacterial cells uh, as part of the, what we call the extracellular polymers, EPS, uh, can actually determine and shape the morphology of the minerals that precipitate. So here, if you increase the concentration of these polymers, 
uh, then what you do is you basically change the shape of the your uh, calcium carbonate from essentially you know crystalline calcium calcium to essentially balls that are actually a collection of uh, different uh, morphologies. And this is to do with, uh, so this is a, a range of amino acids and they're looking at you know, how that might change depending on the acidity of the amino acid. In other words, how dominant the acid group on the amino acid is. But the key thing is here is that the presence of these organic molecules are actually key in modifying the shape um, morphology of the precipitates that we see. And there is actually a well-known uh, mechanism called, uh, of, of crystal growth called uh, aggregation-based crystal growth. And the hypothesis here is that actually uh, when you have organic material present, the organic material sticks to the nucleus or the first crystals that precipitate, the organic material sticks to the surface. And when it sticks to the surface, it actually stops those crystals from growing, uh, you know, to prevent addition of additional uh, moieties to grow that crystal. So this crystal growth path where you've got very good, uh, well-shaped uh, hydro crystals actually is arrested. What you end up instead is lots of, you know, nuclei that then don't grow, uh, but will aggregate uh, in some cases in an aligned manner. So they might look like there's a single crystal, sometimes in an aggregated way where basically you have random aggregation. So the key here is that actually this is a very key biological process. It's, although it's an induced process, it's controlled by the fact that you've got an organic chemistry that's actually uh, dictating uh, this, uh, this uh, morphology. So we did very simple experiments in the lab, which is sometimes what you do is you make an observation, you erect a hypothesis, and then you try and test it. And we wanted to just to see if this is what's happening uh, within the Narakauri stream to uh, see if, if actually we're on the right track. So we did these experiments where we took the composition of the water that, uh, from uh, the stream, the contaminated water, and then basically we drove the pH up. So this is, these are completely you know, without bacteria, but what we were trying to do is just add in different organic molecules to see if we could replicate that. Uh, so you know, what we didn't want was metabolism. And so we have controls here where basically we just have uh, you know, sodium carbonate and ammonia to, uh, keep the, uh, to drive the pH up. And in others where we actually added aspartic acid as one of the model uh, basically molecules that forms up the extracellular polymer. So again, it's an amino acid. And we just let that drift uh, for uh, a few uh, days. And we looked at actually the mineralogy that formed. So first of all, we wanted to confirm that we were making hydrozinsight, which is what should precipitate in the water. And the X-ray uh, crystal structure is suggesting that we're doing that. So we can see quite clearly that both in the control and, and the experimental uh, charges were getting the same structure. And uh, we looked at the morphologies of what was precipitating. So this is initially was actually uh, you know, quite quite surprising because you can see quite clearly here. You know, the the this the the plates mechanism that I was talking about that that score was completely hypothetical, uh, but it turns out that actually you know this is the way they precipitate. I don't think there's a control here. I think this is just the nature of the way the experiment is set up. But the difference is wherever you have organics, uh, instead of just these, these plates, you also have these aggregates that you can actually see uh, in the, the system. And it actually, if you home in, it's remarkable just how similar the morphologies are, okay? So at least that's showing us we might be on the right track, uh, that it's essentially it's the organic chemistry that's controlling the morphology here. And you're only gonna get that where you have life or at least, you know, microbes, okay? Um, I think we did a lot more of these experiments. So that's aspartic acid that we looked at, you know, and the system doesn't seem to work as well when you've got, uh, you know, when you move from amino acids to uh, other amino acids, these sulfur bearing ones. So we think there's a molecular level control here uh, in terms of the type of chemistry that's, that's really key to determining this. But what I wanted to uh, really finish at is, is this idea that actually, uh, you know, having bacteria in this system is quite key to, you know, cleaning up the natural environment and that perhaps we can try to adapt this 
and, and scale, scaling it becomes a problem uh, in terms of using uh, our understanding to clean up uh, other contaminants. So one of the projects that we did funded by U European Union, where it was where we were actually testing whether we can actually use the same processes in this particular case, precipitating calcium carbonate as a way of actually capturing CO2. Okay, so you can extend to, you know, uh, toxic metals to uh, going into uh, other systems as well. Uh, and that work was finished in about 2012, 2013, um, but really quantitatively, it wasn't a process that was gonna make a difference with the volumes of CO2 that we're dealing with. So, you know, carbon capture by, by that method, I, I wouldn't necessarily advocate. <clears throat> uh, so these are conclusions from the first part of my talk. Uh, don't worry, the other part is, the second part is actually not too long. So <laughs> I'm, I am watching the time. But the idea here is that bacteria can be effective agents for cleaning up our contaminated water. Uh, and in fact, there are uh, other type of experiments you can do. For example, I've looked at people using, again, very similar processes where they're cleaning up uh, you know, contaminated systems uh, for uh, radioactive substances. Um, we think there is a morphological control that's you know, to do with the presence of life, but obviously, uh, you know, that will be uh, debatable. But the key thing here is that, you know, can we use some of these observations as a way of exploring for life in other uh, planets or so people that will go to Mars? Uh, but for me as a geologist with my background in geology, one of the things I'm interested in is what's the implication of having these spherical, you know, porous aggregates uh, in terms of uh, fossil preservation. So we look for, you know, bacterial signatures in very old rocks, but if what they're doing is making sure that they can access nutrients and actually breathe by forcing you know, the minerals to precipitate in this porous way, perhaps that also you know, reduces the potential for fossilization. Uh, so you know, that, those are some of the questions that we're still trying to understand. The second part I want to talk about, as I said, is, is how we can use bacteria uh, to improve or to protect uh, the health of uh, plants growing in contaminated uh, land. And the context of this is actually very simple. Uh, cleaning up contaminated land is very expensive if you have to use chemicals or you have to bury it. So sometimes it's actually a good way to actually grow plants or use other you know, form of, uh, of biology to actually clean up the land. <clears throat> and the way you do that is to grow plants on that contaminated soil in the hope that the plant will then extract all the uh, metals, and then you can harvest the plant, you burn that, and then basically you've got a very small volume of waste that you want to uh, dispose. <clears throat> the problem with that is that most of the metals we're dealing with are also toxic, so they will actually kill the plant or reduce the growth. What you really need is high volume to make sure that you're harvesting that contaminant. So what do you do? Well, you can either put fertilizer on and that will counteract some of the growth, uh, the toxicity uh, to improve the nutrient status of the soil. But increasingly people are thinking actually there's a cheaper way instead of fertilizer, you basically just use the natural microbes to see if they can actually uh, protect the plants. And we call this plant growth promoting bacteria. The question is what mechanism do they use? How do they survive the contaminant themselves? and how do they actually uh, protect the plants from uh, dying. So we do very simple experiments in, in a glass house in this particular case where we grow plants and we're using uh, oil, the Indian uh, uh, rape here. Um, we basically grow these plants, but in, uh, in, in some cases we spike them with uh, the contaminants. And then we will look at you know, the growth uh, in some cases uh, comparing where we have bacteria and where we don't have bacteria. Now, I'm gonna own up, there's a slight design thought to this experiment in the sense that we did the controls where we didn't have the bacteria, but we also did the experiments where we did have the bacteria. Um, we didn't grow them in you know, a sterile environment, okay, because we couldn't get access to the sterile growth chambers, but we just put them in a glass house so sometimes the criticism we get is that, well, you know, how do you know this is nothing to do with microbes that you actually put in? Okay, so, you know, a small design for but the idea is that those conditions were the same. So the only difference is the treatment that we started with. And I hope you can appreciate that. So what we do is we monitor growth 
Uh, we also actually analyze what's in the plant tissue and we use spectroscopy uh, to, to do that. So I'll show you some uh, results from that and explain the spectroscopic uh, method itself. We also did some germination tests and here we then combined spectroscopy with some uh, uh, microscopy. So this is biological microscopy called uh, confocal laser scanning microscopy. And what we wanted here is to see whether where we see the metal concentration is where the bacteria are as well, or whether there are other processes. So really it's just trying to, to explain uh, you know, what's happening. So you will see these uh, treatments that I was talking about. So obviously all the triplicates where you see a B, it's brassica that we're dealing with. Uh, Zn is a zinc, uh, where you don't see the Zn is actually a control there. And then uh, we have two types of bacteria. One is a pseudomonas, so it's a P. The other one is a rhizobium. So this is the one that actually grows around regum roots uh, with R here. And so we'll see what effect uh, we see uh, when uh, we do these kind of treatments. And the results are actually quite striking, okay? So this is the control here where we don't have any zinc, we don't have any metal contamination. We also don't have uh, any uh, sort of bacteria. And this is one where we don't have bacteria, but we've got zinc. Okay, so this is a contaminated soil. And this is, has exactly the same amount of zinc, but where we've added the two bacteria. So you can see really striking results where you have, you know, basically a significant recovery in the growth uh, from here uh, by introducing, you know, bacteria in the system. Okay. Now, if you're a biochemist or a biologist, then you explain that mechanism to say, well, it's to do with basically very specific biochemical reactions uh, that are induced by uh, the bacteria, okay? If you're a geochemist or a geologist, on the other hand, you know, you tend not to look at biochemical mechanisms. You tend to think about the chemistry that, you know, of what was happening in the plant. So is it to do with a change in the way that the metal is actually bonded in the plant roots? Or is there, you know, the fact that the bacteria are there and they're actually taking up the metal, which is a part of why we wanted to do this contrast, you know, confocal laser scanning experiments. If you then start looking at the quantitative data, one thing becomes very clear. It can't only be biochemical mechanisms because when we don't have zinc, okay, so these are the ones where we added the bacteria, but uh, we didn't add, uh, add the zinc there is actually statistically no difference in growth. So we're just comparing data here at week six. No statistical difference in growth. So I don't think it's just that the bacteria are doing something that's changing the biochemical makeup of the, 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 uh, the plant. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you look at the metro, the amount of metro in the, the plant. So here we're looking at the shoots, the leaves and stems. Here we're looking at the roots. It becomes very clear that actually there's a paradox here because where we have large metal concentrations in the tissue uh, is where we have the best growth. In other words, that metal is not toxic anymore to the plant. So, and you can only do that by changing speciation. Okay, but we wanted to then confirm that. So what we did was then to actually do our spectroscopy experiments. Um, this is, if, if there is anything sort of that you don't vaguely think is scientific about what I've been talking about, at least this is the only scientific bit. And it's not a method I understand very well. So I'm gonna explain it only once, but pay attention, okay? What we do here is we run spectroscopy. We, uh, we go, this is, this is actually a real place uh, in, in, in Howell, at Howell campus. And what they have there is basically, uh, they generate a beam of electrons. Okay, and then they speed those electrons up and they inject in what they call the ring here. And then they speed them up even more. So they're traveling at a really fast speed. And at every corner here, they've got magnets that bends that electron beam. And the end result of that is that the, uh, as the beam bends actually produces very, very strong X-rays, actually brilliant X-rays uh, of the highest power. And then you harvest those X-rays and those are the ones that you use to do your spectroscopy experiments. Okay, 
So we do a lot of this, basically we take that X-ray beam and essentially what you're doing is you expose the X-ray beam to your sample and you vary the beam. So this is actually the way you run experiment. You vary the beam, you increase the energy. And when you've supplied just enough energy for one of the inner core electrons to be ejected uh, from the inner core to some of the outer energy levels, you get this absorption here, what we call an absorption age, okay? And when that happens, okay, then the electron that you basically promoted uh, for, uh, basically drops back. And when it drops back, it releases another X-ray, so of lower energy. And that X-ray then gets released from the, uh, the element and basically it bounces off to from the near neighbor. So it gives you some information about the near neighbor who the, that metal is actually bonded to. And that bouncing back and forth is the data that you see here, okay, called the XAS, Extended X-ray Absorption Fine Structure. And the information we get here is actually very useful. It tells us what molecules uh, the uh, metal is bonded to. Uh, it also tells us something about the speciation in particular in terms of redox. Uh, so if you're looking at chromites, for example, you have chromium three. If you're looking at the products of chromite after you roasted it in order to do your skin hides, it'll be chromium six and that's a toxic one. So again, you can tell whether your sample has chromium six or chromium three, okay? But the key thing is that it also gives us information about what that particular metal is bonded to because it gives you information about the near neighbors and this is the exact bit. The other bit you can do is actually quite simply do some mapping. Okay, so that mapping actually, you know, again, X-ray mapping gives you some information, some special information. So here, what we have is these are the X-ray maps uh, for the different treatments that we've been doing. So this is uh, basically uh, a control with no bacteria. Here we've got Pseudomonas, and here we've got rhizobium, and here it's a mixture of the two. So the mixture of the two is where we're getting the best growth. So this is the X-ray map. This is the uh, confocal laser microscopy. And what we're looking at here is these tiny concentrations of bacteria here. And wherever you see these tiny concentrations of bacteria is also where you see uh, a lot of the uh, trace metals. So we think, you know, there's obviously something to do with speciation, but also special associations suggest we have uh, absorption as well. What does the data actually look like? Well, actually, so look at the hot colors, the red colors are where you have a lot of zinc uh, in the tissue. And we're looking at root tips here, um, a caveat. So sometimes it can be sort of an artifact of the thickness of the samples So part of what you want to do uh, in the picture that I showed you earlier on is to make sure the thickness of your sample is the same. Uh, but it becomes very clear here when you start comparing where you have no bacteria versus where you have bacteria. So it's this one here. You have a lot more metal again in the root. So the spectroscopy and the analysis that we do in the lab, the chemical analysis actually is confirming that. In terms of speciation then, uh, this is actually really important data because what we're looking at here, again, is a significant change, okay? in terms of what this zinc is bonded to. And I'll just explain it. So we supply the zinc in terms of, in the form of zinc sulfate. And when we start analyzing it in the plant tissue, uh, a lot of the sulfate actually is gone. And I'll tell you exactly where it's going. But what you see then is that the zinc is bonded to uh, different types of other organic molecules. One is oxalate here. Okay, the other one is phytate. So PY, uh, PHY. And the other one is cysteine here. And the key message that I want you to get out of this figure is that in moving from where you have no bacteria, or indeed you've got this uh, uh, pseudomonas here to systems where they're dominated by this rhizobium. Okay, so you've got rhizobium both in here and in here. The system is moving to one where you've got uh, phytate dominance. So this is phytate uh, bonding here to what I call not necessarily cysteine dominated, but at least cysteine is significantly enhanced uh, in, in where you have this rhizobium bacteria. And this happens to be actually quite an important result <clears throat> because uh, in the diet that I was talking about, so in Malawi, in the diet that I've grown up with, 
and, and this is the same with rice and a lot of cereals. Actually, when you look at zinc in those uh, grains, most of it is bonded to phytate, okay? And it is well known that, and I'll show you why, the phytate molecule is actually huge. It's mostly phosphate, okay? And it locks up zinc very heavily. So even if your grains actually have in your, you know, your diet, you have it, the, the ability for the body to absorb that zinc is actually extremely low. So, you know, one way that we're thinking about it is that, you know, are the bacteria here giving us a route to how we might, for example, improve the quality of the diet um, the soils always have enough zinc in them, all right? The diet, as we can see, always has enough zinc in it, but that zinc is not bioavailable. We can't extract it. So we think that this is actually quite a good result in terms of uh, giving us, uh, you know, some uh, ways of thinking about this. And so we know from the literature, actually, these rhizobium bacteria are very good at synthesizing the cysteine. And if that cysteine is dominating the uh, zinc uh, speciation uh, in the uh, diet, then uh, we have a mechanism there for, uh, you know, improving that diet. And this is really just to emphasize this. Again, there's this uh, uh, paradox here that, you know, wherever you see uh, high concentrations of zinc is where you also see uh, cysteine. Uh, so uh, the, and you have a lot more cysteine in the shoot here uh, compared to what you have to the root. So if you take the ratio of that to that, basically that ratio increases in that direction. So the, question, the other question we're looking at, is: does actually cysteine also increase translocation? In other words, moving from the root or the soil uh, to the shoot, which is the diet actually that we're interested in that we harvest. Uh, and so the latest experiment that we've done, again, just is just X-ray mapping, is exactly to look at uh, a comparison of uh, how uh, the metro uh, concentration varies across from roots to stems to leaves. Okay, this translocation. Um, and you can see, sort of, I should explain here, glutathione is actually a much more complex molecule that has got a lot of cysteine moieties. So you can see quite clearly, again, cysteine here and glutathione, a lot of metro concentration within the tissue. So that again confirms the experiments that we I showed you earlier on. But also that as you go into the shoot, and to the leaves, you're getting increasing concentration relative to say phytate uh, and citrate and all the other uh, you know, uh, bonding molecules as well. Okay, so this is really uh, where I, I wanted to, to finish at, and which is just to summarize uh, the outcomes of that. So speciation changes that are key to metal detoxification. You have to change that speciation to make the zinc less toxic. And I think the bacteria seem to do a wonderful job of that. Um, speciation changes are actually driven by metabolic activities. So I don't think you can separate this from the biochemical pathways that our biochemists are talking about. I think there's uh, maybe synergy there. Okay, so in my view, actually, you know, we're both right. I don't think one is wrong, the other one is, is, is right. Um, um, and I think, you know, what I've just shown you is that there are strong implications here for micronutrient balance in terms of you know, what people do in the global south. Um, and so I come back to this slide that I started with, which is like, you know, at the end of the day, uh, this is a study, and I, I'll tell you how important this is. This is a study that's led by uh, the University in Malawi, but also University of Nottingham uh, in the plant sciences department. It's a 4.4 million funded project funded by uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and also, uh, they also got about 2 million from the NERC Global Challenges Fund. And the idea here is actually to map zinc distribution and other micronutrients across three different countries, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Ethiopia. So what they're looking at is, you know, where is the zinc or where are these nutrients? What type of soils are they in? Okay, and how does that soil actually control, you know, whether or not that zinc is bioavailable? And I want to finish at actually what I grew up with, which is actually when I was growing up, my grandfather and my parents always used to grow maize alongside beans. Okay. And then when, you know, the 
agricultural people came in and said, no, no, you cannot do that because you actually stressing the growth of the maize. So make sure you grow them separately. I think that's completely wrong advice from a nutritional perspective. So the caution here now, you know, this is to me my hypothesis that I want to work on for the next few years that before I retire. But I think what I want to do is actually uh, invest in some of the wisdom of my grandfather and my great grandfather and why, you know, uh, basically cereal regum cough planting was quite important in terms of improving the earth. I may not have benefited from that, but I think there's something to worth uh, uh, following up on. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Uh, a little bit longer than I thought. Uh, just a few acknowledgements here in terms of funders. Uh, other than that, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thanks.